Is the arrival of AI a bad thing for society? We've seen a lot of talk about this recently, and it's a really important topic for us to consider. So why ask this question? Um, we've all heard of ChatGPT and Google Bard and OpenAI, and there are a lot of applications that have been built. Uh, there's Chaos GPT and there's Auto GPT and a lot of different applications that uh, are not just a chat interface. And they will actually go and they'll book a weekend trip away for you and make reservations and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of people have actually said that uh, there could be some harm here. So Stephen Hawking has said this could spell the end of the human race. Elon Musk, more dangerous than nuclear weapons. And Noam Chomsky, AI is a threat to democracy and could be used to create a society where people are controlled by machines. Sounds pretty scary, right? Um, the problem I have with these criticisms is that they're theoretical, and I'd like to focus on uh, what changes we can expect based on what's already happening. There are a lot of positive applications of AI that I want to really sh uh, showcase and highlight. So let's talk a little bit about radiology. Um, radiology, for those that don't know, uh, and apologies if there's any uh, doctors in the room, radiology is the study of scans, basically, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs. And a radiologist is someone who sits in a dark room and interprets things. Um, so it's basically pattern recognition on images. And this has been one of the most interesting fields for AI research for many years. And actually, all the studies I'm going to talk about today are from uh, long before the arrival of ChatGPT. So in this first photo here, you can see uh, now MRI. This is a brain MRI. They use something called contrast to highlight different things. So this person, you can see the little yellow arrow has a, uh, a tumor in their brain. And so this contrast is used to highlight the tumor. The contrast, though, has some side effects. And it's estimated that in the United States, 580,000 people have uh, side of, you know, adverse effects to uh, one of the types of uh, contrast that's used. And across the world internationally, there are about 50,000 cases of severe side effects. Uh, and in some cases, they can be life-threatening. So it's important to note that the contrast is very important. You can see all the way on the left, that's the standard dose of the contrast versus the 10% dose in the middle. It's a lot harder to see the tumor, which has infiltrated different parts of the brain in this 10% dose. So this is actually a study from 2019. And they basically used a deep learning model in AI to enhance with just a little bit of contrast. So you can see that image on the right, that is actually only 10% of the contrast. So in other words, the same dose as the middle. And the AI could enhance it to such a point where uh, it was really easy to see. So this is just one example, uh, brain scans. Let's talk a little bit about uh, lung cancer. And this is very personal to me, and I'll share why uh, in a few moments' time. So um, here we have, there's four different photos here. So this, this one here that we see is actually uh, the first one in time chronologically. So these two were taken at the same time and these two were taken at a later time. So this study from South Korea, also from 2020, before the days of ChatGPT, uh, they looked at 117 patients who had lung cancer. Okay, so these people have lung cancer. 105 out of them actually uh, the lung cancer was misdiagnosed. So if you have lung cancer, typically the symptoms are shortness of breath, coughing, you might be coughing up blood and stuff like that. There's a lot of other illnesses that can cause these types of things that are not cancer. And so the first thing that a doctor would likely do is send you for an x-ray. And that x-ray would then go to a radiologist who would write a report. So this study looked at these cases of these people who had lung cancer where the radiologists that looked at the first x-ray missed the cancer. So people that have cancer, that the radiologist missed the cancer. So this right here is the first scan that was taken, and this is just one of the 105 that were looked at. And you can see the cancer here, pretty hard to tell. I mean, pretty hard from the naked eye, but with the arrow, you can see there's a bit of, uh, you know, a, bit of a blob there. Uh, and this was missed. And so they looked at this, and so they took these 105 chest x-rays of people that had cancer who were wrongly diagnosed. In other words, they were given a false negative and they were told, you're fine. It's something else. It's not cancer. And they did a study. They gave it, gave it to nine radiologists. And they said to these nine radiologists, look at these 105 chest x-rays and tell us how many cancer uh, cases you can see. So without the AI, 43% could actually 
notice the lung cancer. And with the AI, 56% could. But let's just go back and take another look at that. So what happened, what we see here is the, the kind of naked image. This coloration is the enhancement from the AI. So this was taken very early when the patient, it looks like stage one or two. Uh, these bottom images, you can see a CT here, and this is the same x-ray, same patient, 447 days later, diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Um, and at that point, um, chances are not as good as at this point. So, and you can see it really clearly here, it's spread to the bone here on the CT scan. So 43% identified without, 56 with. So the delta here is a 30% improvement. And it's not a 100% improvement, it's not a 500% improvement, but this is really something. Um, this is using a model that happened, that came long before uh, ChatGPT. So I've put a photo uh, of my dad and my brother up there, and I wanna share uh, just a little bit how this specific topic affects me. Um, so my dad, so this is the, the Hughes boys, um, my dad actually died from lung cancer four years ago. And just like the woman whose uh, chest x-ray we saw uh, in this first slide, uh, he would have had it for years and had no symptoms whatsoever, was totally fine. And then by the time they caught it, it was too late. And so we're asking the question, what would the long-term global health impacts be if we could detect 30% more lung cancer? Uh, the, the functional idea here is that if you're catching more, you're not catching cancers that weren't there in the first place. You're catching cancers that are there, that are growing, um, that you haven't found yet. So you're not catching more, you're catching early, if that makes sense. So there's, it's estimated that there's 2.2 million cases of lung cancer diagnosed every year globally. Uh, usually it's diagnosed at a very late stage. So stage three and stage four, the odds are not very good. This is not a very good type of cancer. Um, there are different types of cancer, we'll get into that. So there's 2.2 million uh, cases. Uh, so if, what would the impact be if we could detect 30% more cases? Well, it would be 660,000 cases a year. So that's 660,000 lives that you can potentially uh, save, prolong. Uh, and so we can actually look at this. Uh, so there's two different types of lung cancer. I've just blended them all together statistically into one. Uh, let's look at the survival rates. So stage one, uh, when almost nobody gets a chest x-ray, no one has symptoms, the survival, the five-year survival is close to 80%, 74%. Stage two, we drop down to kind of mid 50s. Stage three and four, you're well below 50. And then obviously stage four, you're looking at you know, I think it's seven or eight percent. So what I want you to think about here is that the, the delta between each of these phases is about a year. Um, three and four tends to steamroll, it snowballs very quickly. But stage one to stage two, uh, it's usually about a year. Stage two to stage three, it's usually about a year. And then this stage three and four, things start to happen really quickly. So if we could identify 30% more lung cancer cases, we would be taking people that would otherwise be diagnosed here, and we'd actually be finding them here. And the impact of that is really, really clear. We can actually give these people much higher chances. Uh, and statistically, there are people that actually last, you know, live a long life, their cancer goes into remission forever. So the global health impact, if we could detect 30% more, would effectively move our diagnosis to the left. We'd be finding it earlier when we have better chances. Uh, and that would mean that in 10 years, we'd be saving 6.6 .6 million years of human life. So 6.6 .6 million years. Now, when you think about that globally, that's not a big deal. There's quite a lot of us, billions and billions. But when you think of it in terms of the people who are actually most at risk of dying from lung cancer, stages three and four lung cancer sufferers, it's 156 days of life expectancy. Um, again, not a very long period of time to us, but when you're talking about someone that might have 12 months, that might have 14 months, that might have seven months, adding five and a half months to their lifespan is, is quite a noticeable difference. So that would be the practical impact. So let's talk a little bit about, um, yeah, this is the 660 person years of life saved annually. Let's talk a little bit about Singapore um, because I want to make this a localized uh, story for the audience and the radiology doesn't continue here. I want to talk more generally about AI. So why is Singapore poised to become an AI hub? We're obviously a very advanced country. There's a lot of things that we're doing. Um, 
the first thing, and this is, I think, the most important thing, we trust our government. So this is a little bit complicated for a TED Talk. What I want you to see here on the very right, this is Singapore. And so what this shows is that our trust in government, 76, is higher than our trust in business. So there's only five countries on this that people trust their government more than they trust business. I'm Canadian. Where are we here? Canada. We apparently uh, trust business 1% more than we trust government. Um, I won't make any political comments for any Canadians here. But uh, Singapore, you can see we're the most, we trust our government the most. And um, this is the biggest reason why Singapore can win here, because this is going to require a concerted effort by government, industry, and science and medicine. So we have uh, very high internet connectivity. We have 147% mobile phone penetration. Um, I'm sure we've all taken a Grab or a taxi where the driver has three, four, five devices sometimes. They've got a tablet, they've got all kinds. So that's where that number comes from. We also have an innovation ecosystem. We have fantastic infrastructure. We have a very low tax regime and we have a highly government, a highly digitized government apparatus. So um, how we interact with the government using SingPass, uh, it's a way different experience. In my home country, you have a password and an email address. Those are super insecure. Uh, with Singapore, if I want to look at my tax return vaccination records, I have to do a facial ID. Um, so we're just well ahead of other countries. So where does this lead us? Well, I want to talk a little bit about my thesis for the link between AI and computation. Because what's happening now, what you're seeing in the AI space, is that the cost of compute is actually very high. Uh, and the reason that the cost of computation is so high, um, well, just to explain, AI, uh, you need to build a model, and then you need to train the model on a number of data points, billions and billions and billions, trillions even. And uh, it's very computation intensive. Um, so today, the places that can offer you that type of compute are massive server farms. Very, excuse me, very difficult to build on your own. But if you're working with Amazon, they have AWS, there's Google Cloud, GCP, and Microsoft Azure. So we've, we've all heard of ChatGPT. OpenAI has partnered with Microsoft. Microsoft, uh, it's apparently costing about 200 to 400 million a year uh, for all of these searches to be done on ChatGPT. So there's a big connection between computation and AI. And more AI basically means more computation. So uh, better machine learning. So why do I think this? Why am I saying this? Well, we, we follow Moore's law, you know, the number of chips that you can fit uh, or the number of transistors on a chip, uh, chips on a board, et cetera. So we expect that this technology will increase exponentially. And so we're expecting better um, machine language um, that means that we're going to be able to use the AI, so we get better AI. That creates an environment where we actually learn how to use this computation more efficiently. And what that helps us get is better utilization of compute. And finally, we go to decentralized computation. So um, anyone who's been in the tech space for the last 10 or 15 years, there's this elusive dream that we have of everyone's, you know, everyone's computer, everyone's phone, you being able to plug into a network and do just a tiny bit of computation and earn a little bit of money. The reason that it's not economical to do this is because 99.9% .9 of the time, your home laptop or whatever device you're trying to connect to that network in a decentralized way, it's not going to be efficient. Um, but just how it might be cheaper for you to use your dishwasher or washing machine at certain times of day, it's actually cheaper to use devices at different times of the day. So if you can add an AI kind of processing layer on top of a massive decentralized network, you can use that network efficiently. And if you can do that, that actually in turn creates a virtuous cycle where you're creating better AI. So as an investor, this is something that I'm very interested in, the idea that decentralized networks basically have been impossible until now. You, we've had to rely on uh, Google and Amazon, but we won't have to for much longer because AI will allow us to efficiently use uh, these networks in a way that everyone will be able to plug in. So I won't talk about crypto or Web3. That's the first time I've given a speech in the last five years and not talked about it. But I want to thank everyone. And I want to say that this is a massive opportunity for all of us and a massive opportunity for Singapore. Thank you.